Hello. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome and good evening. Uh, my name is Seth Lewis. On behalf of Harvard University Division of Science, the Harvard Library, and the Harvard Bookstore, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment in our Book Talk Lecture Series. I'm thrilled to introduce this event with Carl Safina, who's presenting his newest book, Alfie and Me, What Owls Know, What Humans Believe. Uh, before we dive into Safina's book, a few housekeeping things to keep in mind. We have two more events this month. The first is tomorrow night. Uh, that'll be Nobel Laureate Kip Thorne and Leah Halloran presenting uh, the, the Warp Side of Our Universe. And then on November 30th, Joshua Wynn joins us for the Little Book of Exoplanets. For more information and to stay up to date on all things Harvard Science Book Talks, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter, social media, and our YouTube channel. Um, so tonight, there'll be about 40 to 45 minutes of conversation about the book, and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, someone will come around with a microphone. If you just raise your hand, we'll try to take your question. Um, and then when we conclude, there'll be a light reception in the Cabot Library. As always, cheese cubes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And so, wow. yeah. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Carl. Carl Safina is the inaugural holder of the Endowed Chair for Nature and Humanity at Stony Brook University. He has a PhD in ecology from Rutgers. His work has been recognized with MacArthur, Pew, and Guggenheim Fellowships, and his writing has won Orion, Lannan, and National Academy's Literary Awards, and the John Burroughs, James Beard, and George Rabb Medals. Carl's other books include Voyage of the Turtle, Becoming Wild, and The View from Lazy Point. Joining him in conversation tonight is Joseph Drew Lanham. Lanham is an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at Clemson. He was the inaugural fellow of the Audubon Toyota Together Green Initiative and is an advisory council member of the North American Association for Environmental Education. Um, Lanham is also a poet laureate of Edgefield, South Carolina and the author of Sparrow Envy, Field Guide to Birds and Lesser Beasts. He's published in a variety of leading journals and media platforms including Audubon, Orion, Vanity Fair, Forest Ecology and Management, and Oxford American. This evening they'll be discussing Alfie and Me, uh, a book Michael Sims of the Washington Post calls a colorful guide to living more deeply through interaction with others who share our experience of inhabiting an animal form. So when Safina and his wife Patricia took in a near-death baby owl, they expected that like other orphans they'd rescued, she'd be a temporary presence. But Alfie's feathers were not growing correctly, requiring prolonged care. As Alfie grew and gained strength, she became a part of the family, joining a menagerie of dogs, chickens, and making a home for herself in their backyard. Carl and Patricia began to realize that their healing was mutual. Alfie had braided into their world and was now pulling them into hers. Alfie and Me is the story of the remarkable impact this little owl had on their lives. We have a lot to learn this evening, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. I'm sure this conversation will be nothing short of a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, you. Hey. <laughs> I want to say... I, I feel, I don't know how Drew feels about me, but I feel like Drew is my brother from another mother. Because of all the people I know, I think our sensibilities overlap just in the warmest possible way. But he's a much better birder than I am. <laughs> and that's saying something, because I'm no slouch. Thanks, Carl. I, you know, it's, um, we're, we're sort of in the same clubs. In, in many ways, and, um, and, and I think our, our meeting has come through this blurring of lines. So um, tonight, as, um, as, as fellow bird brains, um, we're, we're gonna delve into, into things bird, um, maybe not so much hooting, but... Uh, not so much hooting, no. Not so much hooting, but, um, but thinking about identities um, and and identifying not so much the birds themselves but identifying with birds so in, in that distinction um, I, I had a few notes Carl that I 
you know, and, and when I think about your work, your groundbreaking work over all these, these many years, I haven't come across words like sweet, owly love kisses. <laughs> <laughs> and um, much less the photos to, 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 photos to back don't those lie. up. Those, those photos don't lie, and so those are your words. You've written them, um, you have memorialized them um, in photography, and so we're here for a different kind of peer review <laughs> than, than many of you are, are used to. And so Sweet Owly Love Kisses isn't probably going to make it very far in ecology. Um, but the impact factor I would offer, Carl, is very high. <laughs> and, and maybe higher, um, a higher calling than, than many of us realize. And so as your book was introduced, uh, you know, I like to think of it, it is um, a love story. Totally is, yeah. It's a divulging of intimacies. That is very true. It's a vulnerable story. And coming from your training, that rigorous training as a scientist, um, and, and understanding the importance of, of science, and for us almost scripturally, in a way. What brings you to this point of, of being vulnerable, of writing love stories? Why are we here? Well, love brings me to that point. Um, yeah. I mean, um, the more, well, there's so many different ways to approach that question, but le uh, let me just say maybe the most obvious, maybe the most obvious and the least obvious one is that I made a living studying birds for a decade. And uh, I mostly studied seabirds. And the birds I studied were terns. And uh, they, they nest in colonies of thousands. Mm -hmm. And we were interested in things like how many are nesting this year? What percent of the nests are fledging any young? What percent of the eggs are hatching? Um, what are the growth rates of the young this year? What's the mortality rate? Uh, what's the food delivery rate this year all compared to other years? And these are interesting things about the world and its dynamics, but they are generalizations. Mm. And I was watching turns. But an owl found me, and then I was watching an owl. Right. And then it wasn't, it was no longer an owl after a while. It was she, because she had a history with us. We are, we are made individuals by knowing who we are, but we know who we are relative to who else we are with. Our relationships make us individuals. And this little owl, who was with us much longer than we thought she would be, became an individual to us by that history and all those interactions and the trust that was continuous. And, um, and then another thing happened. So I should say, um, a little abandoned screech owl chick was found on somebody's lawn near death, only about seven to 10 days old, about a third of the way to fledging, just a downy little dying thing. And when I got a text message from a rehabber that said, do you know what this is? I said, I don't know. It looks like a dead washcloth. Hmm. Um, and I squinted at it, and I realized, oh, that's a screech owl chick. How did it die? Oh, it's not dead yet. 
So eventually, that rehabber was also our pet sitter and house sitter. She had to go away. I said, leave the owl, because I've kept a lot of birds. I've done a lot of rehab. I used to train hawks, raise homing pigeons. So I have a lot of background. So that's the backstory on how this owl came. And we were just going to do a soft release. And as soon as she could fly, just like normal owls, they leave, but they don't go far. The parents take care of them. And this is something I did when I worked for the Peregrine Fund. And we were reintroducing peregrine falcons. We had captive raised chicks, took care of them. Then we opened the confinement that they were in in the big tower. Hacking box. A hacking box, it's called. And uh, they didn't go far for a week, and we continued to leave food out. So that was the plan, a soft release in our backyard. But there was a flight delay. Her, her flight feathers did not come in normally. All the body feathers came in. The primary feathers on the hand part of the wing came in. This was all bare. And so when her brain said fly, all she could do was flop around. So release was out of the question. She would have yeah. lasted half the night. And um, so we kept her in protective custody in our chicken coop until I could see that not only did the feathers finally come, but they would molt properly. Because when I did a lot of rehab, there was another dying baby screech owl that we rehabbed that never molted properly and never could be released. So with that in mind, I kept this one named Alfie. Wait, named? Named, yes. Named? Well, she needed a name. Well, oh, uh, we are not gonna get, she needed a name. Yeah. What, so we, we mentioned identity, right? I mean, how many people here named their backyard birds? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, did, did, did that? So, so, there, so there's another thing about the names, which is, of course, she needed a name because part of the time she, she had actually been living in our home. You don't want to start just saying it, 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 which is not an it anymore. First of all, a, a, a non-living thing is very different from a living thing. So we need a different pronoun for living things, which uh, the author Robin Wall Kimmerer, Kim. she offers one. That's a distinction we don't have in our whole culture. We call anything that is not human it, because we are enculturated to uh, basically degrade the rest of the world to elevate humans as the only thing that matters. And that's just a deep part of Western culture that is reflected in our language. So, so we named Alfie, Alfie. But then the, the, the most incredible thing about that was that she soon, when we finally were able to open the door, she vanished for a week, which was my biggest fear, but of course that was normal. And then she came back. And when she came back, she centered her territory in our backyard. She has never left. The last time I saw her was last evening. When I, I went outside, I heard her calling. I called, she flew right into the dogwood tree right over my head about five feet away. This is typical of my life nowadays. Mm. Um, but she attracted a mate right away. And we named him Plus One. And plus One. Now, a thing about that that's not in the book, because it happened only this past summer, is that she got a new mate this year, and their personalities, the first male and the one this year, could not have been more different with regard to her and regard to me. And that's another thing that has surprised me so much about the individuality and the relational capacity of individual, in this case, owls. But this stuff is everywhere all the time. We not only don't know it or see it, we don't even think about it. And to the extent that we give it a glancing thought, we assume that they're just all the same. That one screech owl or, or, or one deer is exactly the same as any other, 
and it's just not that way. Well, but that's what the field guide tells us. That's what the f right? that's what the field guide tells us. Yes, and another thing about what the field guide tells us in this regard is the field guide tells us screech owls have two calls, but they have more like six, and you don't hear them unless they're talking to one another and one of them is completely not afraid of you being right there. And, and one of those calls is a call of deep bonded intimacy that is simply very low in volume and you wouldn't hear it if you weren't four feet away from the bird who's doing that. So let me just finish about the first mate. I saw him every day and he was like, he sort of in the beginning was taking his cues from her, like if you're cool with them being here, I guess they're not a threat. And if we were about 30 feet from him, he would do all the things he wanted to do. He, he'd bring food, he would feed her, they would mate, all of that stuff. The new mate, I saw him not hundreds of times before the eggs hatched, I saw him two times before the eggs hatched. I saw them copulate once and he looked like he had no idea what to do because <laughs> I think he was a young bird that had just arrived in an empty territory. And when she was a virgin, she didn't know what to do either at first. And I saw her get it right one night. And after that, it was right the whole time. And her first clutch of eggs were fertile. Now, you do not see stuff like this by watching birds. You, you see stuff like this if you have a relationship with an individual mm. of, of your own or another species. And it's such a, it was such a mind-blowing difference from all my other experiences with all these other birds over decades that she was such an individual. The, the, the mating, I always thought, I was taught, and I, as far as I knew I saw, there's a courtship phase. Males come, females come, they do certain things. Okay, they choose their mates, they're mated. And it uh, was not like that with them. The male arrives in her territory. She's afraid of him. He sort of is chasing her. She turns around and chases him. They're calling excitedly back and forth. It was not at all clear whether he was a rival or, or, or they were going to drive each other, one of them was going to win the t I didn't even know what was going on because it, there was a total lack of comfort and trust at first. He, he just arrived, she confronted his presence, and very slowly they got accustomed to each other and started being in proximity. And then he started offering her food, which she did not take at first. Okay, I don't want you to spoil the whole book. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I want... I can't I, spoil I, this book. It's but, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I need to understand... I need to understand <sighs> the identity with this non-human being. We're talking about using words like trust and relational and being relational and watching birds versus being a birder. Those are two very different things. Very different things. But scientifically, we would call these focal observations if we were taking the data and we were taking band colors on the birds and understanding and doing time budgets and the things that you used to do. Right. You were taking a very different kind of data set here. That's that true. Well, important. when I was a student, I was told science is the search for generalizations. And this was exactly not a generalization. It was just very specific. And, and that, that was just a gigantic difference that really has surprised me and continues to surprise me. Growing up, I was inspired by, by several books. One of them, uh, Sterling North's Rascal. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many people in here have read Rascal, even heard of it? Yeah, okay, you gave your age away, your ages. Um, but then there was another book called by Gene Craighead called My Side of the Mountain. Yep, loved that book when I was a teenager and, too. And, and we watched Old Yeller and we watched all of these sort of relational films about 
blurring these lines that you so artfully blurred here, but part of what Carl does so wonderfully in this book is the scholarship. So understanding um, sort of this, this the lineage of, of, of human musing. And, and so I said here, I said, poets and professors, prophets, presidents, and preachers. All of these people are in this book. I mean, we, we go from origins of Eastern religion and thought up through classical and Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Descartes, I mean, I mean all the way up. I mean, you, you get somehow Coltrane in there, right? <laughs> yes. And, and so in those ways, but this owl, this one individual, this one individual that found you, brought you to this point of collecting this data. So I, I, I would like to talk a little bit about this blurring of lines and how comfortable you've become in this space of going from the time budgets, of going from watching these birds and, and what many would see as stereotyped or they used to see as stereotyped uh, behavior into recognizing individuals yeah. and calling this bird family. Yeah. That's a powerful word, Carl. It is. Yeah. Well, it's been a long evolution. For you? Yeah, for me. It's been a long evolution. Well, it's been a long evolution. has been going on for <laughs> millions and millions of years. But for me, personally, it's been a long evolution. Um, f first of all, you know, as far as um, blurring, well, not blurring the lines so much, but um, just not being too worried about lines. I mean, there's, uh, I'm interested in knowing what really exists, which I think is the basic question of science. And one thing that really exists is that, for instance, birds in general do certain general things. But another thing that really exists is that mo many kinds of wild animals have personalities, which is um, definable as differing responses to the same stimuli. Obviously, if you have dogs, you know that dogs have different personalities. So how far out do differing personalities go? A lot of people that I've spent a lot of time with in the course of writing other books who have studied apes and elephants and macaws and wolves and orcas, they all talk about certain individuals and their personalities. This one is bolder. This one is shyer. This elephant had the whole family break up when her mother died and she became the matriarch because she couldn't lead. She was too indecisive. And so half of her sisters left. I mean, uh, the, the wolves, the, the mother in the pack gets killed and the tightest pack in Yellowstone immediately falls apart. The young start fighting. If you see individuals, you see individuality. And if you look at the research on personality, you see that people have published in the science journals articles on personality differences in spiders. And, and all the vertebrates that it's been looked for, people have found it. And I think they have found it because it's there. So, I, you know, to me, it's just, I'm just interested in what really is. Luckily for me, I had an advisor, PhD advisor, who um, was very, um, what's, what would be the word? She was just open. Mm. She was just open to seeing what's there. She liked 
the birds we were studying um, didn't just all see them just as objects and just as data. She saw them as beautiful, interesting things. And in my experience, all the people I know who've studied free-living animals out in nature, uh, they all have all these kinds of stories about individuals. And some of them, their whole research depends on individuals. Like Jane Goodall was the first mm -hmm. one who named her chimpanzees. And right. she was told, you can't do that. And she said, I have to because they are individuals. This was like completely revolutionary at the time. Now, in the history of science, this is so recent that all the people who, who have ever said this, they're all still working. You know, Jane Goodall is still around. Ian Douglas Hamilton is still around. So, but you know what was different about Jane? She was Jane. Yes, well. And so when we look at the history of, of conservation and sort of the objectification of things, of these beings, it, it's, it's, it's sort of fallen out of the, the ruts of that paradigm for, for Jane to lead the way for Rachel Carson to say sometimes it's more important to feel than to think. And so here, you've taken this track, you've gone outside of those, those rails that science might define to collect this other data that I say we don't use a field guide for that, you're using your feel guide yeah. for it. So, I, you know, part of, of, of what attracted me to this book, Carl, once I started reading it, was, was sort of the lyricism in it. And you're a lyrical writer. Um, I don't know if you claim poet, but I published a poet in your, a poem in your book. Well, you're there so. in Dawn Song. <laughs> so it's, that's one of the hardest things to do. If, you, if I ask how many people in this room are poets, people would shrink from it. People generally shrink from it. And the science generally shrinks from that lyricism, right? Um, and so here, here we are, you're a celebrated scientist. But, but I would also say when I ask the audience how many named their backyard birds, bird watching is one of the most popular outdoor avocations in the United States, but it has not helped birds. Hasn't. And I would contend that far too many are interested in counting the numbers of birds as opposed to thinking about the one bird mm -hmm. and caring. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit, you talk about revolution, but you also talk, talk about being revelatory here. How, how do you take this message in Alfie of this love of a bird, this bringing this bird in as family, how, how do you use that? How do we use your words, your lyricism? And I would say sometimes, Carl, I have to use this word, sometimes there was a certain mysticism. Well, and the I, world is very mysterious. Okay, all right. So in that, how do you press that forward for the good of all owls or warblers or other, other species? How does Alfie and me move that conservation message forward? Do you encourage everyone to name birds in their backyard or to take those relationships in a different direction than we have previously or been comfortable with as scientists? Oh, well, comfortable with as scientists. That's a different sort of a coda to that question, I think. Um, in in ecology, uh, I was always taught when I was in graduate school that um, we're only interested in questions about how the natural world works. We're not interested in applied solutions to problems, hmm. which always struck me as a bad answer. Uh, and, I, and I never accepted that answer as valid. It just struck me as lazy, actually. People who didn't want to sully themselves with actually trying to improve something that they 
saw as problematic, I just thought were, you know, totally copping out. Um, so there was, I guess there was, there was that sort of a, a feeling about it. Um, I just forgot the second thing I was going to say in response to that. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think. Well, uh, yeah, okay, so let, me, so let me say the third thing. I'm going to get something here because I'm going to have you read something. Okay. Um, so th the reason I talked about the, some of these philosophers and other people that you've mentioned is that here's an, here's an owl in my suburban backyard and I was, because of COVID, this is another major aspect of how this all came about. Because of the shutdowns for COVID, my calendar got completely erased, like all of you. And so instead of having to go to the airport and having to be away for a week and having to go to these meetings and having to go teach in the classroom, I had nothing better to do than sit in the yard and watch Alfie, which what, well, what could be better than that? So I watched for about five hours a day. I got up before dawn, I went and found her. Usually she was in a reliable location. I'd follow around a little bit until she settled in for the day. I would do the same thing at sundown. And that's why I saw all of these incredibly fine little nuances, because I was watching for about five hours a day. Some people have said, how can you watch owls for five <laughs> hours a day? These are people who watch television for five hours a day. <laughs> Much more than that. Or they, or they sit in an office cubicle for eight hours a day. It's a different, it's a different kind of binging. Yeah, yeah. So my question then became, why don't we know who is living in our backyards? Why don't we see any of these? How could I, who watched birds for 10 years, be surprised that courtship involved the slow development of a trusting relationship between two individuals? And my question was, is this a limitation of the human mind or is it is our disconnect a cultural thing so how do you answer that you look at other cultures and um, that can be mind-boggling but i found that i could coherently for myself anyway think of four cultural realms to generalize about mm -hmm. Individu uh, uh, indigenous peoples who have tremendously varied cultures. I mean, just think about Inuit people in the Arctic and, uh, and people in the Amazon. I mean, the cultures are, couldn't be more materially different, but their relationship to the world, their, what they say about the human place in the world is very, very similar through all the indigenous cultures that I was able to have a look at. Basically, they believe that other living things have agency, that they have awareness, that they use their senses, that the world is material and spirit at the same time, which physicists would say, well, it's matter and energy at the same time. So that's sort of an intuitive thing about that, in addition to belief in souls and other stuff like that. Uh, if you look at South Asian religions, the Dharmic religions, they, they say, well, other beings on the planet with us, they all have agency and they're all, we're all in a network of relationships and the human role in the world is to not upset the relationships and the world is sacred and holy. If you look at East Asian philosophies, it's all about maintaining the relationships that balance the world and keep the world going. And the human place in that is to not upset the balances in the world. And the, that the opposites are all necessary to create the whole. You can't have life without death. You can't have up without down. You can't have hot without cold. Then you get to the West, which tells an outlying, totally different story, which is that humans are better than any other living thing. We're actually better than the world because the whole world is here for us. And there's the ideal, 
which we can imagine versus the real. The, the earth is not such a nice place. It's not such a great place. We need to get to the ideal place with the eternal soul that's only in humans. That was Plato's idea. And that became part of the basic idea of Western theology because the, the, especially the, the, some of the J Jewish theologians, but especially the Christian theologians, were quoting Plato and this view that perfection exists off the planet outside of space and time. This is an outlying thought that literally says people are better than the world and the, the globalization of that Western thought has resulted in the catastrophe that we are creating. So, so that's why the book has all of that thinking because Alfie made me ask, why are we blind to all of this? Is it, is it that, our intelligence is limited, or are we taught this blindness? And just, a bird caused you to ask moral questions. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and so this this whole idea of morality in in conservation, in environmentalism, mm -hmm. and what pushes us, what motivates us to consider other beings. Um, this this book takes us to those places and it and it, and it and it and it no it does and it and it does so artfully i would offer um you know you're you're, you're likely going to find this book i would imagine in nature writing and ornithology um but i would certainly take it into my environmental ethics mm -hmm. course right um i i know we haven't finished here but i i had something i wondered if you'd do some reading i'd love to hear your voice sure. Um, in some of this, and I think our audience would too. Um, and I've, I've, you can read whatever you want out of your book, Carl. There's a lot. Uh, but I've, I've marked something here that I thought was, for me, that, that stuck. And so beginning at that little asterisk there, as, as far as you want to go. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm just going to, so Drew just bracketed a couple of paragraphs, and I'll, and I'll just read them. And I guess uh, I need to give you a little bit of backstory about where this paragraph mm -hmm. comes out of. We <laughs> this, is the, this is by far the most unscientific part of the whole book. <laughs> oh, why would I choose that? <clears throat> A bunch of years ago, um, maybe about a decade ago, I was having, I was having drinks with a, f a physician that I was teaching a communications course with. And I don't exactly know, I mean, we were talking about something about people dying. And she, she just said very matter-of-factly, well, you know, when people die, birds appear. And I thought, well, first of all, that's a w weird thing to hear from a physician, I thought, um, but I had never heard this before, and, and it immediately connected to a couple of stories I knew about people I knew who died, and then people said, you know, like, the day he died, there was this wren that just kept hitting the window, trying to come into, I just remembered that story, which I didn't think that much of, except, oh, you know, cool coincidence kind of a thing, but then I started keeping um, a list of these stories, which is now about 15 pages long. I don't know what to think of it. I just think that if you already know what you refuse to believe, that's not scientific. So I am just keeping a list. And um, a neighbor of mine passed away the summer we were raising Alfie. And um, he was, he was my neighbor across the street from a little beach cottage that we have on the east end of Long Island. The first time I went to that cottage, a few days after he died, he was a guy I loved. And not, and not only that, but P.S., he built the nest box that Alfie has always nested in. So the, the few days after he died, I went to the cottage, and at first light, I heard this banging, and I thought, what, what's going on? You know, so I, I'm open my eyes groggily, and there's a crow that is hurling itself against one of my windows. It's a, it's a window that opens 
out on a hinge from the bottom like this. So then the, the, I'm thinking like, well, does it see its reflection? Is it picking bugs off the window? It went under the window and was hurling itself at the screen. And I'm just lying in bed. What, and I'm thinking, what in the world? OK, so the next paragraph is, you know, the question is, what? Is this a messenger? Is what? Why would birds who existed for tens of millions of years on a planet without humans and who have been so abused by humans be messengers to us? Isn't that just another self-aggrandizing delusion of our own importance? But perhaps it's just the opposite, a sign of humility, a symptom of our fear that we are actually meaningless, an evocation of our desire to connect to something real and beautiful. If it is merely our imagination and our run amok tendency to make connections, to what exactly are we yearning to connect? I see detriment in living according to fears of divine retribution, laws cast in stone, and a universe conniving capriciously to bring or withhold luck. But I don't see much harm in wondering whether the universe is better than it seems. Meanwhile, we can continue to try to live our best life. If the universe is better than it seems, if there is something more afterwards, well, that would be a nice surprise. Alfie was, for me, a messenger from the real, authentic, original world, a mentor of sorts. What can we learn from birds? The answer might be everything we really need to know. During one of the now frequent California wildfires, a flying owl entered a, fl a firefighting helicopter, despite the noise and the rotors, and simply hung out there with the crew for a while. Perhaps the bird, faced with the catastrophic loss of everything needed and known, was catching a breath above the bewildering flames and smoke. Or perhaps the bird was temporarily possessed by a messenger spirit. But no supernatural explanation is needed. The message is clear. The owl and the fire itself bore the same warning about the flight path we are on. It used to be that when we said the world is on fire, we meant it metaphorically. Thank you. Thanks for picking that out. I, um, and it, it, there, this book is full of those moments. It's full, of, it's full of the science and, and what we don't know about owls, what we do know about screech owls, a bird that more than likely um, many of you have, have experienced by, by sight or sound, more than likely sound. But then to have you in this way make yourself vulnerable to us through this bird who turned out to be a muse for you in a, in a very w real way, but also a mentor, as you said, because here we, you are in the darkest of times. Yeah, that was an awful, awful year. And this bird, in many ways, I think, saved you and perhaps has the capacity to save many more of us if we'll pay attention, Carl, in the way that you have paid attention to Alfie and in the ways that Alfie paid attention to you. And so I'm grateful for the book. Um, I'm grateful for the stories, but I'm also grateful for the revelatory nature of it. Because I think in that vulnerability, what you begin to do is to give us courage to feel for these beings, to not objectify them as simply data points, mm -hmm. but as field guides for us. So thank you for that. Well. What would you have chosen to read? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> um, I tabbed one thing, maybe, if I can find it quickly. Um, okay, sensing 
connection. There's obviously a discussion here about connecting, which is kind of the whole book. I mean, this is toward the end of the book. Sensing connection to realities larger and more permanent than ourselves is the basis of religious feeling. All things that scaffold the life of this world, the waters, the air, the plants, the plants that make the form of oxygen that animals breathe, the breathing animals, are indeed larger in space and across time. All of them who have crawled or swum or run or remain rooted or discovered their wings are either our ancestors or our relatives. This confronts us with value of such enormity, our entire existence, the sheer possibility of us, that we mostly cannot see it. Retinas and the illusion of sight were not made for perceiving this view of life. Getting in on that wavelength requires a slightly more engaged attention. But we can say this, one needn't look far. Birds at a feeder, a flower garden, the wolves in our doggies' clothing, they make those connections materialize. And of course, we had Alfie. Alfie doesn't always show up right away. Patricia and I sometimes have to wait, talking to the night air. Where are you? Where are you? As if reciting some sacred incantation in hopes of conjuring her. But if we can have faith in anything and feel certain that our faith is well placed, my faith is in the living. The religion that is followed is not religion. What is prayed is not prayer. Neither is what is spoken to be believed. What lives and how we live, that is religion. Show me what you're grateful for, and I will know what you believe. Alfie's sermons were brief, but she was a powerful preacher. She and I lived the shared prayer. It's deep, but it's delightful. Thank you. I think it's uh, time for some questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Safina. I've read your uh, Becoming Wild, and now I have read Alfie and Me, so I, had, uh, I was able to prepare a question ahead of time. Uh, it is one that emerges from reading your book and that you hint at, uh, but I would like to probe you further on it. By way of background, I'm a, trained as a, a molecular developmental biologist, uh, then mid-career shift to evolutionary biology, molecular systematics of arthropods, and now I'm, now I'm retired. Um, so uh, here, here's, my, uh, here's my prepared question my prepared question. In imagining, uh, so this follows a thread in your book, uh, but not one we really talk about today. In, ima uh, in imagining a better future for the West, you say that scientific questioning is a valuable window on objective reality, but not on what you call routes of travel, in quotes, that get you to that reality. You, mean, you exemplify its value in the science with astronomical studies that literally expand our awareness of the world and ecological studies that enable a deeper appreciation of non-human relationships within that world. But now I would like to know what you have to say about suborganismal or functional biology when it destroys life as it's widespread in so-called basic research in order to understand life's mechanisms or as in biomedical research when it uses animal models in order to avoid loss of human life with the eventual aim of fostering human but not the lives of our fellow animals. Or simply ask, how do you better, uh, how do your better routes of travel mesh with invasive research on our fellow animals? And how do you think Alfie's action-oriented way of understanding his world, of striving to survive in his world, provide guidance and thinking about the human practice of biology, biology in particular? It's a question about the nature of biology. Well, it's, I think it's a question about certain practices in the pursuit of biology. Um, and that, that is an ethical question with, to me, a broad, fuzzy 
boundary between what's clearly white, right and what's clearly wrong. You know, there's this, there's an ethic in medicine, first do no harm, but there's a lot of harm done in medicine because people have to do things or they make mistakes or they are just wrong until they understand things better. Um, Darwin said about cutting animals open that you shouldn't do it unless the knowledge gained is of such um, import and practical applicability. Those were not his words, but basically you shouldn't do it unless you're gonna learn something big enough to justify it. I don't know how you quantify the boundaries there, but that is clear guidance anyway. I, I think um, some invasive studies on animals probably have yielded uh, a, a lot of really important uh, information, and I think uh, and a lot of them have not. Um, I know, for instance, at our university, because this was the subject of a long-running lawsuit and battle, there were two chimpanzees that were housed in the basement of the anthropology building, and a graduate student was using them to study the evolution of bipedalism in humans, which I don't think justifies keeping two chimpanzees in a dungeon. But well, what I've, I guess what I've learned from Alfie is that all, well, most living things, all sentient beings, all sentient beings seek a feeling of well-being and freedom of movement. And that's a, that's a guide to what's right and what's wrong to me. And how does that relate to human knowledge? You, you, said, uh, you said it might justify uh, this. Uh, how would Alfie say, what do you think about human knowledge? If you asked Alfie, what does he think mm. about human knowledge? I don't think Alfie thinks about human knowledge. <laughs> but I will say that there are times when I know Alfie has eaten a big meal now, I said she's five years old now, and she's been free living for four years. I know, I know there are times when she's eaten a big meal, and she'll come and land two feet away from me and let me reach out and scratch her head. I know that's not a satisfying answer for you, but it's, just, it's a satisfying answer for me. If, 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 can I? Yeah, follow? absolutely, please. Just a, a little, um, and maybe tangentially, uh, because part of this, as a as a wildlife ecologist, and what I do, and and part of my work now is is beginning to do what I call conjugating the wild, and so thinking about that condition and what that condition means, and part of Carl's concern, fear, really, was that Alfie would not be wild enough. Oh, I was obsessed with that. But wild enough, but also worried and concerned about her in ways as a wild being that she would fall victim to wildness. Um, you know, the human conceit in that is that we construct wildness. We move people off of landscapes, indigenous peoples off of landscapes to call it wild. Um, and, and that is a, sort of an experiment in itself right, for human condition. So when we talk about wildness and we talk about what it does for us, but then we, we create places, Central Park, where we've moved whole communities of color away to create wild conceit, you see. And so in that way, that's an experiment in the human condition. And the equalizer to me is to be in a place where you become a lump of protein. That's an equalizer. If you've ever been in that space, or you have ever been in a situation where something other than you dominated that landscape, um, 
Or seascape. Now, or seascape, in the, right. In the, in the realm of the great white shark resurgence here. Right. And, and, and so, and, but, but it drives us to this, again, um, really, this, this conceit of Plato of, of, of our dominion over nature, which leads then to this idea that we can experiment on anything we want to as long as it benefits us. But then that takes us to the level, too, of within species, of intraspecies, of racism of genocide. So I think it's a relatively small step between the two. And as Carl said, yeah, sure, it's fuzzy. Um, but we're thinking, first, do no harm, but let's finish that. Because really, there's not a period at the end of that. There's an ellipsis. First, do no harm to those like me. Does that make sense? And so I, I think in that way, Alfie taught what Alfie has taught me in those moments when she approaches you and allows you, gives you the privilege of crossing that boundary into her wildness in a world that you can never know. She gives you a privilege that then for, for me is, is it's humility. And it's, yeah. and, and it's, and it's shrinking back to this place that, that maybe offers a little chance at empathy. But, I mean, you know, what are, what are, the, what are the responses? How, how do we go forward? Is it, is it modeling? I don't know. I, you know. They're great questions. And so people spend lots of time in classes discussing them, people that are better equipped than me. Well, I don't know. You accused me of uh, having the courage to feel, but you, you are the, the, the prime example of that among scientists I know. Who has another question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Safina. Uh, when you talk about trust and interactions, uh, bird calls, uh, to me, because I hang around machines all day, it translates to authentications and protocols uh, when mm. establishing, uh, when two entities are trying to establish communication. Uh, it makes sense to me why you, uh, as a human, would attempt to communicate with Alfie. But how did you know that Alfie was also trying to communicate with you? Not only that, how did you begin to believe that Alfie was trying to communicate with you? Um, how was it that you were able to shed the human tendency to elevate your intelligence over Alfie? Um, this is a really bad start to any answer, and I, and I once got really caught really badly starting this way, but... <laughs> How did I know she was attempting to communicate with me? It, it's completely obvious that that's what she's doing because there's, so that's the part I get in trouble with when I say it's just obvious. It's not a good answer, but there's, there's no other explanation for a, a bird that, this, is, this happens all the time. She's calling really loudly at dawn, when she's gone to bed for the day. She's calling really loudly. I open the window and call back, and she stops immediately. She wants to know where we are relative to one another. And that's what they do with their mates, but in the non-breeding season, that's a common thing that happens. I'll hear her outside at night. I'll walk out the back, I'll call, she'll come flying in. The volume of the same call will immediately go way, way down. And now the call will mean, I see you, we're here together. I acknowledge you, we're here together. If I reach up to her, her usually her first response is, a, is like a food beggy kind of a screech because she wants to know if I have anything to eat in my hand. <laughs> and then 
when I start just scratching her, and I, if I don't have anything to eat, which I usually don't hand feed her, if I start scratching her, I get what I call the cozy call, which is this little intimate ooh, 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 and she'll close her eyes and lean into my touch. <laughs> so it's obvious because there's simple, I can't think of any other explanation for that other than she knows who I am, she trusts me, she likes the proximity enough to seek it out, and this is just she has that bond and that bridge of trust with me. Normally, they would show that only to their mates and in the breeding season to their young ones, but that's a capacity they have, and she shows some of that to me because I've always been there in her awareness. In a sense, you are performing a sort of handshake. Foreplay, maybe. <laughs> Alloprening. Alloprening. We were preening each other. That's what, that's what they do. That, that's, um, and why do we preen? Why do we preen our human companions? It, it, it's part of the physicality that goes with reinforcing a pair bond or an emotional bond if we're doing that with our children, let's say. I think there's someone here. Okay. Uh, do you think there's anything special about Alfie being an owl with regards to this, or do you think it could have happened with any other bird species? No, well, I think um, owls do a lot of preening each other. Allo preening is the term for that. And so that capacity is something that, you know, she turns to me or my wife sometimes. A, a, a finch or a blue jay, they don't do that much preening of each other. Parrots do a lot of it. And that's something that parrots show to humans mm -hmm. before they go psychotic, usually. <laughs> mm. The relationship part, well, I've had, that, I've had that kind of relationship with some other birds of prey when I, when I used to train hawks um, differently because they were trained and it, and, mm -hmm. and it was a, different, a very different dynamic. With, with Alfie, I never wanted to, uh, I never wanted to, you know, make the dynamic anything where there was any implied command of any kind. So that's a little different. But, you know, um, parrots and crows, owls, hawks and falcons, they, they are all, I, I think, a lot more relatable to humans because they have that way of relating to one another that's different than things like songbirds. But it might just be a matter of the, our time scales. They, they act in time scales that are more comprehensible to us. Small birds like finches and things, they, they seem so jittery and jumpy, but I, at their time scale, they're just moving around. They're not being jittery and jumpy. So it may be just be that that's another aspect to why we connect more easily with certain kinds of birds. I'm speculating there a bit. Thank you. So I uh, grew up raising chickens, and I could see that each chicken has an individuality. And I really see your point, uh, even with chickens, even the ones that unfortunately are slated to, for factory farms. And my question is related to the, this obsession with consciousness that science has and philosophy has in the history of you know, um, at least Western civilization. And my question is based on your study of animals and interactions with owls. So how do you see this question of consciousness? Of because consciousness. science you know, yeah. grades consciousness, humans 
are the most conscious, but based on my own experience, I've seen that even chickens do seem to have glimmers of consciousness. Yeah. So how do you essentially see consciousness or right. define consciousness based on your experience? Sure. Well, know? based on my experience, uh, there are a lot of people who are not very conscious. <laughs> Consciousness is, is a tricky thing to talk about only because the word means different things to different people. So some people, they meditate to attain a higher level of consciousness. Not really what we're talking about. That's more like a different level of awareness, blah, blah. Okay, but in a, in a more scientific sense, consciousness is the thing that feels like something. If you feel, you have consciousness. And so what feels? Well, let's look at animals. Animals includes everything from sponges to, you know, mammals, let's say. You know, in evolutionary history, it more or less goes that way. I don't know how close to sponges and corals you have to get before there is not, for them, something that feels like something. But certainly, all the vertebrates Look at our sensory apparati. We all have eyes, ears, senses of touch, uh, senses of balance, senses of temperature. There's not five senses, there are all these other senses. Some of them have magnetic senses. Many of them have perception that is much more vivid than ours. Their alertness is, is way higher, apparently, than ours, and, and a lot of them we, we know f quite factually, they can see and do and, and hear things better than us, faster than us, stronger than us, um, uh, see more acutely than we can see, th all these things. If a humanoid had those capacities and was wearing a cape, we would call them a superhuman superhero. But because they're not people, we say we don't care. Mm -hmm. And that just reinforces the, the, the central conceit of our Western culture, which is we're better than everything else. We, we don't care to learn so much about how they communicate. We try to teach them English. And, if, and, if, and the answer sheet to the exam is always our answer sheet. And that's why we make these tremendous mistakes in understanding and valuing all these other inhabitants in our living family. I think cephalopods are changing all of our minds. Cephalopods, they, you know, octopuses <laughs> discriminate between different individuals. Some people they like and other people they just don't like and they squirt water at them and they, um, I think, you know, I was looking at insects in my shower, we had the, you know the cave crickets that come inside at this time of the year? They creep a lot of people out. Well, I, there were two of them in my shower stall this morning at home. And it shows you what kind of house we have. <laughs> and so I turn the water on and they go and find two little spots where the water can't hit them. And I just thought, if a dog did that or a child did that to run out of the water, you wouldn't think twice about the idea that they understood what was going on and they didn't want to get wet. What is a cave cricket actually experiencing? But they're clearly experiencing something. So that means that by the definition I like, uh, which is Christoph Koch's definition, uh, <coughs> Consciousness is the thing that feels like something. I just really think that that says it. All right, so um, any more questions or are we? It's cheese cube time now. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming. I especially want to thank Drew for taking the time to do this with me. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. If you make your way to Cabot Library, there will be cheese cubes. And I'll uh, be signing whatever books. And there will be books signed. Yep. Okay. Thank you.